On Five News, the people who watched an MP die. The trial of Thomas Mayer. Here's a police 999 call as the attack on Joe Cox unfolded. If you hurry up, you'll get him. Okay. There's hell on this chaos. He stabs people and shot people. Joe's family were in court to hear the harrowing evidence, also this evening. Anger from the families of the Hillsborough victims as a former police officer tells his side of the story. Wouldn't you actually care if people were saying things about you that weren't true? Feeling flush in the run-up to Christmas, a surprise boost to the economy as we all spend more than expected. How the hero pilot behind the miracle on the Hudson is making his big screen debut and... <laughs> Find out what happened when another Hollywood great dropped into an Edinburgh cafe for a spot of lunch. Hello and welcome to Five News, I'm Sean Williams. The trial of the man accused of murdering the MP Joe Cox has heard a recording of a police 999 call as the attack unfolded. The jury also listened to eyewitnesses describe what they saw. One man said he watched a man with a gun blast a woman lying in the road before walking away like he didn't have a care in the world. Thomas Mayer denies killing Joe Cox outside her constituency surgery near Leeds in June. Charlotte Grant reports. Joe Cox was the MP for Batley and Spen and a local girl. Her parents and sister were in court today to hear evidence from some of her constituents those living and working in Bristol who witnessed the alleged murder of their MP. The jury's been shown footage of Joe Cox arriving in a silver car to hold her constituency surgery. Shortly behind was taxi driver Rashid Hussein. He said when he saw her being attacked, he recognised Joe Cox immediately. He told the court Thomas Mayer warned him, move back, otherwise I'm going to stab you. He said, better move back. He shot twice, then moved back and shot again. His last words were, Britain first. David Honeybell had hoped to see Joe Cox at her surgery, but instead said he saw her being shot by Thomas Mayer. He told the jury he stood over her and cocked his gun. He stood over and blasted her. Asked what Thomas Mayer did next, he said he just walked away, as if he didn't have a care in the world. Thomas Mayer denies all the charges and sat in court looking straight ahead as witness after witness described how cold and calm he appeared that day. As many of the witnesses gave evidence, they motioned with their arms to show how Joe Cox was stabbed, with one telling the jury it was slow and precise, as if he knew where he wanted to hurt her. Watching in court was Joe's family, at times clutching each other's hands. Witnesses described Thomas Mayer holding what they called an abnormal-looking gun and that he appeared as an odd, dishevelled man. Let's talk to Charlotte now. She joins us from outside the Old Bailey. And now the jury has been listening to a 999 call. Charlotte, tell us more. That's right, Sean. Just in the last few minutes, that audio has been released to the phone call. It was made by Darren Playford, who witnessed the aftermath of the attack. And he told the court how he went out of his way to follow the man accused of killing Joe Cox as he left the scene. Here's a short clip. If you hurry up, you'll get him. OK. There's hell on this chaos. He stabs people and shot people. He's got a black baseball cap. It's like the black he's got the black carrier bag in his right hand. Okay. He's got a grey shirt on, Brown Hill Road, which is off the Freud Lane. You get a police car at the top of there and at the bottom you'll catch him. Now, Mr Playford continued to give a running commentary on the phone until police arrived, even telling the operator at one point, he's following me, I'm trying to get away from him. Thomas Mayer denies all the charges and the trial continues. Charlotte, thank you. A book on the Hillsborough disaster written by a former South Yorkshire police chief has been described as disgusting and offensive by some of the families of those who lost their lives. Sir Norman Betterson has written his account of the tragedy in which 96 people died, saying he wanted to put the record straight after being vilified. Peter Lane reports. 
Norman Bettison has always denied being part of a police cover-up designed to blame the fans, but now he's angered the victims' families by publishing Hillsborough Untold, in which he describes the personal impact on him of what he calls an inaccurate and unfair narrative. He writes that an early police account of Hillsborough that he was involved in collating was hopelessly incomplete and insufficient, but says it was no conspiracy and that he has to defend himself. I go to great lengths to demonstrate the empathy that I have for the, uh, for the, for the families who've, who've struggled against false narratives for, uh, for, for 27 years, setting the story straight. Wouldn't any of us, wouldn't you actually care if people were saying things about you that weren't true. Only a few months ago, an inquest ruled that the 96 Hillsborough victims were unlawfully killed, and in the new year, a decision is due on whether anyone should face criminal charges over the disaster and its aftermath. So for people like Steve Kelly, who lost his brother Michael in the crush at Hillsborough, the book is an insult. The title of the book, Hillsborough Unsold, Hills has been, has been told many, many times, and Mr. Betterson now sees to see himself as some sort of a victim in this. The timing of it now, I know this is in bad taste. It, it, it could have waited till after um, the new year t till for the book to come out. And such is the strength of feeling across Liverpool that few bookshops, if any, are expected to stock Sir Norman's account of events. We're certainly not going to be stocking it. Um, I think. It's important for people to remember that Liverpool, that the verdicts at the Hillsborough inquest would not have been achieved without the people of Liverpool sticking together. Norman Bettison has said he wants to amplify the Hillsborough tragedy, not detract from it, and that the proceeds from his book will go to charity. Peter Lane, Five News. Hurricane force winds have wreaked havoc in West Wales after what witnesses described as a freak tornado hit the town of Aberystwyth. Winds reached 94 miles an hour, causing damage to buildings, boats and caravans. No one's thought to have been seriously hurt, but police and firefighters are urging drivers to be careful of the debris on the roads. Hillary Clinton has spoken about how upset she was at losing the US election to Donald Trump. In her first public appearance since she was defeated a week ago, she said she was deeply disappointed to the extent she just wanted to stay indoors. Now, I will admit, Coming here tonight wasn't the easiest thing for me. There have been a few times this past week when uh, all I wanted to do was just to curl up with a good book or our dogs and never leave the house again. Hillary Clinton. Now, how much are you planning to spend this Christmas? Well, high street shops are bracing themselves for a bumper festive season after new figures show we're buying more than expected. Retail sales hit a 14-year high last month, much better than predicted, with spending on winter clothes and Halloween being the main reason. So, are those Brexit economy warnings now a thing of the past? Dominic Reynolds reports. It seems there's just no stopping Britain's shoppers. You might have your eye on your Christmas shopping list now, but shop figures have revealed that we all gave a very special present to our retailers back in October. The biggest jump in spending for 14 years. So who was doing it? Did you spend loads in October? To be fair, I did. What did you buy? Uh, a few birthday presents. I buy it all the time. <laughs> Nothing stops you? <laughs> Nothing stops me. Okay. Yeah, I, I have spent more than, more than last year. Um, How come you're feeling so confident? Feeling flush? <laughs> Not at all, no. Oh, actually, I've got a new job. Don't get any money back on your savings and, you, you, you know, and your wages are down. <laughs> You're smiling, but that's not good news, is no, it? No, it's not good news, really, but that's the way of it. <laughs> so not feeling too flush? No. I work hard and I keep my savings and very healthy. So no worries here? No. Tourists with pockets full of weak British pounds are one factor behind the 7.4% rise on last year. Another is a very profitable Halloween. But by far the best performer on the high street was clothing. It turns out this is all about something pretty simple, the good old-fashioned weather. We had a very mild September, so it seems most of us put off buying our winter clothes until October. 
But analysts are warning numbers like these can't carry on forever. When news from the financial markets really starts to burn through, when we maybe see some you know, above average inflation happening, that is when we will see a change of consumer sentiment. And that, of course, means a change in consumer buying habits. But for the moment, whatever the weather, the sun is shining in the retail sector. You'll probably have noticed your local shopping centre gently hinting that you might want to start shopping for Christmas. But this year, despite gloomy predictions, the country doesn't need much encouragement. Dominic Reynolds, 5 News. The government is facing fresh accusations this evening that it's lost control of the country's prisons. Earlier this week, 10,000 prison officers went on strike over concerns about violence and staff shortages, saying the system was in meltdown. Today, there was more bad news for ministers. Our political editor, Andy Bell, reports. Is this the reality of Britain's prisons? It's claimed these pictures on social media show prisoners posing in Guy's Marsh prison in Dorset, with drugs apparently on show here and the message, party night tonight. It's another embarrassment for the government in a week when prison officers staged what they called a protest action over cuts to staff numbers. Cuts which they say are putting their members at risk. Today, their union representatives have been meeting the Justice Secretary. I've never ever known it in such a dire position where staff morale is so low, where prisoners are bullying and uh, fighting amongst themselves and assaulting staff and feeling effectively in control so they can run their own environments within that uh, within a prison environment so and that, that's you, your members have lost control of some prisons you feel not through their own design through the lack of support they've had through government the government's promised to recruit another two and a half thousand prison officers but the relationships clearly strained after the justice secretary described this week's action as an illegal strike they have um, called unlawful industrial action which i was not happy about uh, that's why we took them to court Prison officers have now come back to work. I'm pleased to see that. I go around prisons a lot. I meet some fantastic people. They have my full support and full backing. And what I want to do is work with them to make our prisons better. It's not just the prison officers who say the tension behind bars is rising fast. Charities too say cuts to staff numbers combined with current prisoner levels mean further tragedy is likely. I really do worry that we will see a situation where a staff member may be killed. We've had murders of prisoners by prisoners. I don't think we're that far away, sadly, from a situation where uh, prison staff lose control of a, of a wing of a prison or an entire prison and a staff member's life is put at risk. Both sides in this want to avoid that, but each expects the other to play its part. Let's talk to Andy now, who's at Westminster. So are the two sides coming together or not? Well, they came out from their meeting about an hour ago and both were sounding positive and that is important because there was real strain because of that action earlier in the week. But it is about prison officer numbers, what the Prison Officers Association calls boots on landings. The prison officers say they need many more to ensure that safety levels are kept at the right kind of level. But with the best will in the world, the government is saying they, of the numbers they're trying to recruit, maybe they will have another 400 by the end of March next year. That probably isn't going to be fast enough for the Prisoners Officers Association and after they came out of their meeting today they did say they reserved the right to take the sort of action that they did this week. Andy, thank you. Coming up on 5 News. Brace for impact. What? The veteran pilot whose real life heroics are making it onto the big screen. And celebrity spotting Scottish Leo, style as Leo, Edinburgh Leo, wheels out Leo, the red Leo, carpets Leo, again. Leo, I've loved them forever. It's amazing. I'm obsessed with them. It's the best day of my life. Seriously, the best day of my life. Oh, I'm so happy. We'll see you after the break. Welcome back, you're watching 5 News. Now, imagine feeling very ill, going to hospital and then being forced to wait on a trolley for hours while nurses struggle to find you a bed. Well, Labour say more and more people are facing exactly that every day because of chronic shortages in the NHS. Hospital bosses say the problem is being tackled, but for one patient who's spoken to 5 News, the experience was extremely difficult. Ruth Liptrot has been to hear her story. 
This is Mandy. Last month, she was taken to Worcestershire Royal Hospital with pneumonia, but instead of being admitted to a ward, she spent more than a day on a trolley in a corridor because no beds were available. And this isn't an isolated case. I was on there for 27 hours. I was disgusted. I was in pain. I felt upset. I was cold. They said they was waiting for a bed to put me on. I should have gone to respiratory ward, but apparently it was bursting. But this isn't an isolated case. According to Labour, new figures in the first quarter of this year show the number of people waiting 12 hours or more on a trolley almost trebled compared to the first quarter of last year. But Mandy isn't surprised by the figures and is worried about how bad things will get over the winter. I'm 53. But the people that were coming in at old, there was people moaning on the trolleys. Um, they say they've got a contingency plan in place for winter. I don't think so. I don't know where they're going to put the patients because they're going to come in thick and fast, ain't they? The Worcestershire Acute Hospitals NHS Trust said that they treat patients in order of clinical priority, but that sometimes patients do have to wait for longer than they'd like. But Mandy doesn't blame the hospital staff for what happened. I think the government and the head of the hospital should get their heads together, put more money into the, in, into the NHS, because otherwise people are going to die on them trolleys. Eventually, she did make a good recovery after being admitted to a ward. Her worry is that others may not. Ruth Liptrot, 5 News. Now, it could have been a disaster that claimed the lives of all 155 people on board. Instead, when both engines on this US Airways flight failed, its pilot managed to keep calm and land on the Hudson River in New York. Yes, on that river. The images are unforgettable. The pilot's feat was dubbed a miracle. The pilot was Captain Chelsea Sullenberger, or Sully, and now his story's been told in true Hollywood style. Minnie Stevenson reports. This is the captain. Brace for impact. What? What happened on the River Hudson on the 15th of January 2009 was so miraculous it sounded like the stuff of movies. And now it is. Mayday, mayday, mayday. This is a Cactus 1549. Directed by Clint Eastwood, the film Sully, starring Tom Hanks, tells the real life story of a pilot's quick thinking. When the passenger plane's two engines failed, the captain had no choice but to emergency land in the middle of New York's. River Hudson, saving the lives of all 155 people on board. At the time, the incredible story of survival made the news the world over, turning Captain Sully into a reluctant hero. Playing him, Oscar winner Hanks praised the pilot, saying when others would have panicked, he didn't. He would have gone through that's never been done before. Every time it's happened, it's going to rip the nest, it's going to rip the engines right off the wing, and we are going to cartwheel, and we're going to fall apart. And I probably won't even survive. He didn't think that. He thought, no, I can make this. I can make this landing. The rescue operation from the water took just 24 minutes and brought the city of New York together. Aviation experts say what happened that day was unprecedented. To lose their engines at that stage of flight and then to have, go through the decision-making process that they had to land on the river was an incredible event. And the pilots showed their professionalism and teamwork to such a, an incredible degree. It's not a crash. It was a forced water landing. While what filming the blockbuster, which cost nearly £50 million pounds to make, Tom Hanks said passers-by kept shouting I'm one name. And it wasn't his. Oh, man, did I get a lot of that. Sully! I got an awful lot of the Sully screamed at me. Way to go, man! Miracle! Miracle man! Miracle on the Hudson man! Sully! I got that everywhere I went because of that. Diving for the, river. the film lands in cinemas on December the 2nd, with critics already predicting Hanks' performance is worthy of an Oscar. Of course, the real star of Flight 1549 is, and always will be, Captain Sully. Minnie Stevenson, 5 News. To Scotland now, a country generally seen as straight-talking and down-to-earth, while it appears to be getting a bit of a reputation as a celebrity haunt. Last year, George Clooney turned up in the capital to help support the city's homeless. Today, his Hollywood pal Leonardo DiCaprio was at it too. What's going on? Warren Nettleford explains. A quick bite at lunchtime came with a side order of Hollywood star power in Edinburgh. Oscar winner Leonardo DiCaprio was signing the autographs outside and perhaps he paid the cheque inside this restaurant. 
Edinburgh may have many tourist attractions, but on his first visit here, fans were just delighted he came. It was amazing when he got out, wasn't it? It was it's just so like, lovely. oh my god, it was so, so lovely. lovely. And he came straight up to us. We were the first people he came up to, so it was really, it was special. Everything, absolutely everything. I've loved him forever. He's amazing. I'm obsessed with him. It's the best day of my life. Seriously, the best day of my life. Oh, I'm so happy. <laughs> this restaurant, called Home, has been able to pull in A-list talents because they believe in its mission. A restaurant which gives all its profits to homeless people and provides training and employment to former rough sleepers like Colin and Joe. Oh, well, it's something that not a lot of people get the opportunity to do. And I'm lucky to be one of them. It's really down to earth, nice guy. Really good guy. OK, selfie away. To me, to me. This time last year, it was George Clooney's turn to smile for the cameras with staff in Edinburgh. He came to the owner's first venue, a cafe called Social Bites, which also donates all its profits to the homeless. Modern French and Scottish cuisine was on the menu for lunch. The owners will be hoping he left on a full stomach before appearing at the Scottish Business Awards. Warren Nettleford, Five News. Let's see what's coming up on Five News tonight. Matt's here. Hello there. Hi, Sean. Yeah, we're going to be talking about Sully. Minnie is on her way to the red carpet premiere of that movie, and she'll be talking to star Tom Hanks about his Oscar hopes again and also the speculation he might consider standing for president. Who isn't these days? <laughs> we'll also be joined in the studio by record-breaking bungee jumper Simon Berry. Here he is in action. That's slow motion. But it's what he does at the bottom of the dive that's won him a Guinness World Record Find out at 6.30 what happens. He does survive, by the way. We're not going to see it. OK, thanks for it. I have to tune in. You Thank must. Thank you, Matt. Clean the ear, the weather next. Max, but at 6.30. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow. What the